Hello, welcome and good morning to our webinar. My name is Erin Musselman and I'm on the marketing team at HiveMQ. Um, thank you again for joining. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone wherever you are in the world. Um, today we'll be doing our webinar, how to build an IIoT system that shows ROI in 2024. Before I pass it over to our speakers today, just some general tips. If you have any questions during the session, please submit them using the Q&A button in the control panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to answer all of them. If we don't get to them, we'll try to reach out to you following the webinar. Um, and now without further ado, I'll pass things over to the speakers um, introducing Gaurav and he's going to give you the introduction to the rest of the team and um, the briefing on the webinar today. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Erin. Hi, everybody. My name is Gaurav Suman. I'm joining you from Ottawa, Canada. I lead product marketing for Hive MQ. Fantastic to all, have you all here. Uh, with me, I have Ravi and Ryan. I'll start with Ravi to give a quick introduction and then he can pass it on to Ryan. And then please pass it back on to me, Ryan, so I can start sharing the slides and we can get going. Ravi, over to you. Thank you, Gaurav, and uh, good, good morning, good afternoon, wherever, wherever you are in the world. I'm actually uh, based in Chicago, Illinois in the US, uh, but today I'm actually in our um, headquarters in Landshut, Germany. It's a beautiful little town just north of uh, Munich, and I'm here for some product discussions. So I, I'm actually uh, part of our uh, marketing team. I'm an industry solutions manager for some of our industry verticals like manufacturing, uh, logistics and transportation, energy, and those uh, verticals. So I do a lot of evangelizing on behalf of HiveMQ outside, and I'll, I also help our sales team be able to sell better into those verticals. So I'm here to talk about the industry trends and answer any questions. Um, I will pass it on to Ryan to introduce himself. Hey, everybody. Uh, Ryan Duziong here. I'm a solutions engineer here at HiveMQ, so I work uh, quite closely with a lot of our uh, customers and prospects on um, proof of concepts, uh, but also on uh, with technical questions, demonstrations, um, you know, attending quite a few uh, trade shows and participating in industry associations. Um, so it's a real pleasure uh, to be here today talking with uh, these two fine gentlemen and um, looking forward to the discussion. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. So, you know, the decision we made here um, is that we will use this more as a panel. And I am here because, you know, I'm I'm the guy who will make sure that, you know, I can ask the, the good questions and the best answers will come from Ravi and, and Ryan here in the room. So these are the people to keep your eyes on. Um, Ryan, as he mentioned, you know, he works very closely with with, with customers and, and prospects across um, multiple verticals and especially in IIoT. And, and Ravi also is very, very deeply involved in industry associations, mm -hmm. um, events, and and all these external collaborations that HiveMQ has been a part of. So that said, uh, the background for our uh, presentation today is a recent survey that IIoT World ran um, around IIoT strategies, what people are thinking about, what they're trying to do, et cetera. And we thought it'll be a good opportunity for us to look at the results or at least some of those results together and reflect on them, right? Bring an element of real world um, use cases, some, uh, some reflections there, and make it useful for the audience who's present on the call and those who'll listen to the recording. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll follow along a few slides just to sort of have a, a proper conversation here uh, with the team. And uh, in the way, if you have any questions, thoughts, you know, uh, keep, 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 them, keep them coming. So that said, um, um, Ravi, speak to me about this. What are, what are people really saying here, right? You've, they've, they've, you've got these big, big five takeaways, where if you don't mind just sharing with me your perspective and any sort of element of uh, reality that you're seeing in the industry um, around the takeaways from the report. Yeah, so for, first, why don't we introduce the uh, the report itself, right? Uh, this is something that we sponsored, but IIoT World actually conduct, conducted it on our behalf with our com community members. And these are people like uh, solution architects, uh, IT project managers, uh, business executives, technical executives like CTOs and CIOs, technical managers. So you have like people from the entire gamut of like people that look at I IIoT and uh, we got some unique perspectives. The goal was to see how companies are adopting IoT technology. IoT is industrial IoT, and the challenges they face, what benefits they get from achieving this, and um, you know some of the key technologies that are being deployed. So we got a total of about like 350 respondents um, to this, and then we got some very very good information. 
So HiveMQ actually has created a wonderful report around this. Uh, and that is something, uh, it is a must read for people that want to gain more information, which you can obviously uh, get more information on. We have a blog that we put out on this and a white paper as well. And the links to both will be made available to uh, our audience and they can uh, download the uh, download the report. And once uh, once they go in and get some of the information as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Yeah, and Ryan, uh, if, if you don't mind just chiming in here around, you know, why do you think a survey like this is important? Do you see these results are reflective of what people are working on currently, what they're thinking about? Any thoughts you have on this? Yeah, absolutely. Like on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm working with a lot of people who are um, doing these uh, individual projects as part of kind of a, uh, a bigger vision sometimes, but other times um, these are projects that are started for individual uh, reasons. And what we have is um, a survey here that can really help people to understand the context of that project in kind of the, the bigger context of their organization and their organizational goals. And this can really help with, you know, getting um, influential stakeholders on board with your project <clears throat> and also helping really to guide uh, the planning and prioritization at the outset in a way such that um, your project can be successful and kind of uh, help it avoid bottlenecks along the way and really benefit from uh, the experience of all these people that have uh, graciously filled out the survey. So uh, that's really why I think it's important from uh, my perspective. Yep. Excellent. All right. So moving on, right now we'll just uh, zoom in and get a little closer to what we saw as the results and and the and the areas that the survey covered. And this one is very interesting for me, right? It's 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 really about you know challenges and hence the benefits that people expect to to uh, to get to when they mm -hmm. solve those challenges, right? So Ravi, uh, let let me point you to this. <laughs> the results I think give us the answer, but let me ask the question first, which is you know why do you think IIoT projects don't deliver the results people were expecting. Yeah, first, uh, may, why don't we start off with explaining what IoT is, just to kind of like give the definition, because I think different people consider IoT differently, if you will. So to us, IoT is basically industrial Internet of Things, right? Uh, which was a term coined um, by G Digital, and uh, it basically refers to the extension and the use of the industry, the Internet of Things in the industrial sectors and applications, right? using the power of uh, smart machines, real-time analytics to take advantage of like the data that's put out by machines. Machines that historically don't like really um, are not able to put out this data, right? You, you throw in some smart sensors and make them like smart, if you will, so that they can start like collecting information and sending this out to um, like a higher level device or an application that can then make sense out of it, right? It has significantly revolutionized uh, industries by enabling Things like real-time uh, data monitoring, predictive maintenance, process optimization, anything that is data-driven. I mean, data-driven decisions, right? I mean, it, it's really helped with enhancing, like in, in the industrial context, right? I mean, efficiency, uh, productivity of the of the plant or the operations, um, obviously make allowing them to be competitive, right? Because in, in situations um, where like uh, there is a lot of competition around the same thing, people have used IoT to make them, to keep them, set them apart, if you will, right? Uh, obviously leading to economic growth and uh, sustainable practices for uh, for companies. So that is the uh, kind of like the why IoT and uh, why why it is important. Um, maybe, uh, so I think like, do you want to talk about the challenges right away? I think like we also want to talk about like um, why this, this having a strategy is important. So maybe I can ch jump into that. Um, yeah, yeah, reason, go, go for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll go for it. Yeah, so basically, um, you know, what we found out is that, like, uh, if you want to be successful, right, uh, with an IoT, you need to have some kind of a strategy. And this goes back to digital transformation, right? And um, it's it's all about, like, uh, having the right people, the right process, and the right technology coming towards, uh, coming together to be able to uh, achieve a common goal, right? Um, obviously, like, um, right people are, like, you know, the management people, right? Uh, so setting the goals and setting the expectations and ensuring that they remove all the impediments. So the people that are looking at IoT can, can look at the right technology and then follow the right process, if you will, right? And all that comes together to, uh, to ensure that like 
you know they they are as successful as possible right there are some impediments which we will talk about later but that's kind of like um why kind of like having an iot strategy is important because it's the amalgamation of these things coming together that will help the organization achieve their digital transformation right yeah right. that makes sense um so ravi um, uh, around around the challenges um, yes. i think this this question got closer to that which is which is about okay how do you how how are you placed currently mm -hmm. right you're yeah. you're just getting going etc so it's interesting to see people are um people are thinking about building a strategy around iot sure. um sure. right any any thoughts on this what you see as results here yeah i mean like um yeah so the uh, the the million dollar question is like uh, hey you know you have your strategy in place you have all these people in place and other things in place but yet projects fail right and why is that the case right uh, you know according to bain and company with that did a uh, some some analysis 80% of iot projects uh, fail to scale meaning like uh, they may succeed in like a small poc proof of concept but they don't see the light of the day and that the the reasons are like just the complexity of the the integration and the inability for them to take that beyond like that small poc that they did because somehow there are factors that needed to be considered to make sure that this works across the organization that is not been considered so while the poc may be successful the scaling doesn't work i mean if these challenges are not addressed and accounted for i think obviously uh, your implementations will fail even though you succeeded in the small scale poc but implementations will fail right and this goes back to like uh, the top challenges goes back in my opinion and also agreed by the survey respondents to a lack of leadership support right i mean hey you know your poc is successful but leadership is not quite there so you cannot see the light of the day or maybe a lack of budget right i mean an uncertain roi hey you know i'm spending all this money and i have to spend this much more money if you will to make this successful i don't really see the benefits and i have this this probable thing that people keep saying that if it ain't broken don't fix it so i don't know why i should be spending all these millions of dollars when i don't really see the benefit coming out of that right oh by the way Uh, i don't really want this data to go anywhere outside my plant right so i have like reservations against it so i have like uh, cybersecurity is a big issue here right, that i have to address and that is a big risk to me and those are some of the reasons why we see iot projects uh, failing yeah so ravi let me also bring in ryan and just uh, yes, ryan please. from your perspective any context you want to add real world um, scenarios that you 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 think we should add into the uh, mix here go ahead please you speak speaking on mute ryan yeah just in terms of these uh apologies uh, just in terms of these challenges that you see on the screen here one of the biggest ones is uh the leadership and vision and management support and ravi's uh spoken a lot about that and just to give the perspective from the project team when you're thinking about your project and you're thinking about um all these uh challenges and the benefits that you can get from let's say a digital transformation on the whole it's really good to think about that broad context because then you can kind of pick out other sort of low hanging fruit that might have some kind of synergy with what you're working on initially and that your team has has identified up front like maybe a, a certain uh cost savings is initially something that uh you're looking to do but then later when you're talking about uh incorporating an MES uh maybe then you can have more clarity on which vendors are performing um you know on the plant floor versus others um and you can use that information in your vendor management and so putting the initial project in the context of the bigger picture can really help you to get buy in from um you know broader stakeholders and the organization as a whole and that's really important because every time you're putting in these new systems you're going to be um you know needing to involve eventually like initially when you're doing your 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 POC it might be pretty self contained and you're you're running this software on your own um but eventually you're going to need to put that uh software into production and you're going to need part of the IT budget uh in order to do that and IT as soon as they get involved right they're thinking about the the skill availability of managing that and and the training involved and the the maintenance of the infrastructure and 
um, you know, managing that vendor relationship of the software that you want to put in place. And so there's a lot that they need to think about. And then if putting that in the context of bigger goals can help them kind of justify that cost with, uh, with their stakeholders as well. And so a big part of this um, and what we really advocate with, with uh, our customers is making your vendors to be really um, a partner, like looking at them as a trusted partnership because they can help you um, not only with, you know, um, best practices and understanding, um, you know, these things, uh, these concepts that we have in this uh, survey and how to communicate those. They can also help you think about how to structure the costs for that, um, for that infrastructure over time and make it really work with how you're looking to sort of roll out um, these, um, uh, these, these projects. Um, right. Yeah, and uh, I don't know how much uh, time we have on this one, but uh, I could also jump into cybersecurity here a bit. But, yeah, let's um, please yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's, it's probably you know, if you look at outside of the, the the sort of principle of leadership management, the first sort of functional thing you see in here is cybersecurity. So yes, let's please um, share our thoughts on that. Uh, Ravi, you want to go? No, no, no. I want Ryan to chime in on cybersecurity. Okay, please. Yes, please. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so when you're thinking about Cybersecurity, I mean, that's one thing that comes up with IT, right? Um, almost immediately. And uh, this can throw some roadblocks into the process if you're not considering this early on when you're selecting um, the software and the technologies that you're going, are going to use as the infrastructure for your project. Because, and I'm just going to give an example here, if we're thinking about something like point-to-point -point technologies like HTTP, when you're trying to kind of um, create connections between these systems and share information uh, in real time, it may work out for um, some kind of smaller projects um, when let's say scale is not an issue, but when you start putting in the cybersecurity considerations, point to point uh, technologies require incoming connections to the systems that are providing that information. And this is a big kind of no-no when it comes to uh, cybersecurity in the, in the OT space. And so what they're, um, what's gonna be kind of much more well accepted are technologies where those systems need to reach outwards. But that creates a problem. You need bi-directional communication with those systems. And so, um, when we think about uh, technologies like MQTT, it kind of addresses uh, those sort of security concerns at the outset and can kind of, um, you know, help avoid uh, those roadblocks sort of later on in the process. Right, right. Yeah. And Ryan, I mean, again, from, a, from, from the perspective of your day-to-day -day interactions with customers, right, how do you, how do you go beyond sort of, um, yeah, the, uh, the areas we see as, as, as more of a you know, percentage response, but how does it come to life in terms of sort of, you know, vertical specific understanding you you, you need, uh, best practices. I think you mentioned that. Speak to us a little bit more about, you know, how those how those become more relevant as we um, as we try and help customers solve some of the challenges we looked at in the previous, uh, previous slide. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when customers are thinking about their architecture and that initial project and how it fits into, uh, the bigger picture. What we try to do as a company is really develop our expertise in the individual verticals that we serve. Mm -hmm. um, and when I mean that kind of expertise, I'm thinking about things like really understanding the market dynamics that they're facing as uh, a company. So when I say market dynamics, I mean things like, uh, you know, the business drivers, uh, things like the economy, uh, trends in the economy, um, things like competitive di differentiation, uh, you know, customer preferences, you know, how all these things are sort of driving the need for these solutions within um, customers. And that can help kind of bring more context to the project. Um, and then, um, you know, use, uh, help people use that to do exactly what we're talking about here in terms of bringing in more external stakeholders and sort of justifying the project in sort of a, a bigger uh, picture. And so that's a big thing that we're doing. Um, right. But also, yeah, uh, also along with that um, are these uh, best practices. Um, and I, I think 
you know, alliances really go well with that. So when we're trying to understand what is the full solution um, that will help uh, a customer to address these market dynamics, a lot of things come in there, right? Not just um, our, our software, but other, um, other software, other uh, systems that our software is going to be interacting with. And so we try to help by making relationships with those other vendors, really kind of not making uh, customers sort of take the leap from understanding our software to how it works in an ecosystem to understand, uh, to address those market dynamics. So we try uh, as, as much as we can uh, to help. And so um, this is, you know, all going back to um, how we can help as a trusted partner um, and why it makes sense to really think of your vendors in that kind of um, light. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And if I can yeah. chime in on this one, right, this is, uh, this is important, right? I think uh, Ryan touched upon the trust factor, right? Our customers, uh, either prospects or existing customers, really need to think of us, HiveMQ, as an extension of them. Like, for example, this week, I'm here talking to a big pharma current pharma customer that opened out their roadmap to us and said, hey, this is what we are trying to do, guys. You guys are already helping us a lot in, our, in the compliance section of what we're trying to do. You are you are a, kind of like part of the that critical kind of ensuring that the data flows through in a, in a secure and reliable way. Now we're building out something new and we want your feedback on how to how to design this and we are providing them feedback. That's the level of trust that um, we are able to develop with customers where they feel that we are an extension of them and we, we can help them achieve their goals of being technology forward or being uh, digitally transformed in, uh, in, in many ways. So just, uh, just wanted to add that perspective also. Absolutely. Thank you, Ravi. That, that, you. that is interesting. Yeah. Uh, so moving on to this uh, sort of the, the, the data connectivity aspect of it, right? What's the context in which customers are um, living today and, and how they're getting uh, stuff done, right? Uh, and that's obviously, you know, this is more of a current state of things. Um, and they all come with their own respective set of limitations and challenges. Um, Ravi, let me start with you. What have yeah. we heard? What do we understand? Can you correlate that, what you see on the survey results here also in terms of the sort of the variety and the spectrum of, you know, connectivity options that IIoT, uh, you know, deployments have to live with? Right. Go ahead. Right. Many of the customers that come to us, even multinational big customers that come to us, right, they're pretty, obviously, like um, Fortune 500 companies. They kind of like uh, what we typically see is they grow by acquisition, which means like they already have some factories, they acquire another company, they acquire some factories from them. Each of these systems are kind of like using their own architecture, their own way of things. And even that has kind of like grown organically where each division within the factory or, or the organization has their own goals. Uh, they work autonomously. So it's not necessarily like talking to each other in, in a seamless way, right? I mean, they, they have like from a connectivity perspective, at least, they have like bandwidth constraints because of how they operate and uh, and how like uh, how they kind of like go about setting up their system. For example, the connectivity issues typically is rampant. Again, you know, talking about oil and gas operations, I know we have a few participants from from oil and gas that would appreciate this. You have your um, remote oil wells and the upstream oil and gas. It's kind of like in the middle of nowhere, so even like cellular connectivity or satellite connectivity is is as a big challenge there it's not consistent right so you're sitting on those uh, those kinds of issues again talking about oil and gas and other environments say mining and others so you have harsh environments for working which is not conducive for having workers always there so anywhere where you can kind of like automate things where workers don't have to be there is uh, is interesting and useful for them also because they grow by grew by acquisition and they didn't really plan out like their their industry 4.0 and we'll kind of define what industry 4.0 is right they have legacy equipments that are not necessarily smart and so there is no way to kind of like uh, easily like plumb for, through them to get the data so there is a lot of work and effort to do that and because of the fact that each division has their own autonomy they've chosen kind of like different architectures different vendors to get data from that don't necessarily talk to each other 
So they have their own way of communicating in different protocols. So there's always some, some challenges around that, right? So these are some of the typical challenges that we that we encounter uh, when we talk to customers. And surprisingly, this is not just like small companies. Like I said, these are all large companies that are kind of like putting out like really big products that change the world that have such issues. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you, Ravi. I just for, uh, I think, some background here, when this mm-hmm. survey came out last year, I, mm-hmm. I think we saw the same number one, number two, right? HTTP sure. being one and MQTT being a close Correct. second. Correct. Um, I think Correct. we are we are continuing to see that trend, which is, we which do. is good. We do. Um, and, and that's for a reason, right? And that is where I would love to bring in uh, Ryan and talk about, you know, why it is that MQTT seems to be sort of uh, continue to grow in this environment. We also see MQTT spark plug. So Ryan, I would love to just come to you now and talk about sort of the the relevance and the value of the MQTT in an IIoT uh, context. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, Ravi did a great job sort of outlining all of the challenges in terms of um, data connectivity. And this is really mainly within the context of the Internet of Things. And when you think about mm-hmm. the Internet of Things, um, you think about, you know, remote things, things that are connected over uh, unreliable networks, whether that's satellite or wire, wireless or you know, 4G, for example, Wi-Fi. Uh, but also a big um, aspect here, which is often uh, overlooked, is that you know, long hop kind of networks are also a, um, uh, a big part of the challenge here in terms of connectivity of things. And things, a lot of times, um, you know, even if those networks are, are hardwired networks as opposed to wireless, um, but things in this context can be systems. Um, they don't always need to be uh, a device or a machine or um, even a mobile application. And so um, that's sort of the context in which MQTT uh, plays and, and, and the things that it addresses and the things about it that make it so appropriate for this are the you know, event-based nature of MQTT, the publish subscribe uh, aspect means that data is over only flowing over these networks um, when it needs to be. This can create huge uh, sort of data transfer savings in terms of going to the cloud, um, but also um, uh, yeah, also, yeah, not having to sort of pull that data uh, continuously, um, you're only receiving uh, the data that you need to. But there's there's also the the aspect of MQTT, which is the complex routing. So um, this gives clients the ability to sort of subscribe to things that they're only interested uh, in receiving, to the data they're only interested in receiving rather than getting everything uh, as a big sort of uh, bulk data. Um, that they need to sort of parse through uh, and also that that data goes over the line as well. Um, There's multiple aspects built into MQTT for security uh, for, you know, it's based on TCP and TLS. And so this makes it very secure. Um, Also the reliability aspect, if you're going to be sort of leveraging these cloud applications, um, especially in an operational context, but even in a critical business context, the transfer of that data needs to be ultra reliable. And MQTT just contains features within it, like the quality of service aspect, which make uh, transferring that data in an event-based manner to be super reliable. And that sort of comes back also to this uh, idea of knowing when things are connected, because if things are event-based, you're um, in, and they're not sort of triggering any events or sending any data. How do you know that they're just not offline, that you're just not missing information? Um, and so uh, the whole session state aspect of MQTT is really appropriate for that um, as well. Everything goes back to that event-based um, aspect. Awesome. So Ryan, yeah. one thing I'll just share with our audience here is also, as we can see here, right, the the learning curve is 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 still on the up, right? People haven't heard about MQTT. They're mm-hmm. looking to learn about it, considering it. But then again, you know, it'll be interesting to see at what point they will begin to evaluate it as something which can help solve their challenges. Uh, right. I'm particularly pointing this out because we spend a lot of time educating, or rather I should say sharing and then learning in the process also uh, from our uh, community what MQTT is about, what it's worth, where is it headed? 
So I invite you to take the MQTT Essentials course via HiveMQ University. And this is where you learn about MQTT as a specification, as an open standard. And as Ryan was pointing out uh, previously around the cybersecurity challenges and what it takes to make a system operate in a challenging environment reliably, you'll see that you know the spec itself talks about making this work in a hostile environment. In an industrial context, we're talking about assets which are way out and perhaps sometimes in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> Those mm -hmm. could be physically broken into and stolen and accessed, and somebody might try to re-engineer or reverse engineer what was going on in the in the device. So, how do you protect against those kind of scenarios? And those are things which MQTT has been ground up, you know, uh, built for. So, when you go through yeah. the essential course and you know uh, information, which is available via our, uh, our website and HypeMQ University, you'll be exposed to uh, a lot of that knowledge. Ravi, do you have a thought? It, and then I yes, the I do. I do. I do have a quick thought. Um, and thank you, Ryan, for summarizing that wonderfully, right? So I can provide the context of the meeting that I have this week. And uh, we are talking to this customer that's uh, a pharma customer that's building out this new facility. And one of the reasons why they actually chose MQTT to be that center is because the facility is designed in such a way that each of the, uh, the, the devices or the appliances is going to be moving and it's going to be fluid and uh, has to like share the information of like uh, what what they call the stat the stats of like the the, the machine itself needs to be shared and because of the M mqtt's mqtt's event based uh, architecture and uh, publish subscribe based architecture it is very conducive for providing this information so decisions can be made on the fly so that that's why they they told us that we chose mqtt for this specific reason and, um, yeah. and it's very interesting because we also have stats on HTTP being almost equal to MQTT, but it really um, it really is interesting and to us because HTTP is a completely IT-based protocol and MQTT is more IoT or IIoT, right? So for IIoT use cases, MQTT is most conducive for the reasons that Ryan mentioned. So, and there is definitely more education that's needed around that. And we are doing that and uh, definitely would like the audience to also get educated around MQTT uh, using some of the courses and uh, the certifications that we have. Awesome. Okay. So Spark plug, you know, the, um, the MQTT Spark plug, um, you know, number was also fairly, fairly high. Let me just actually go back and, and see what the exact number was. So approaching about 10% of um, the people who were surveyed, they were looking at MQTT Spark plug. Um, so speak to us about this, Ryan. I'm, 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 uh, I'm sure you you keep encountering Sparkplug enough. So what's going on in this is in this Sparkplug land? Uh, talk to us about that, please. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, when it comes to Sparkplug, uh, Sparkplug is you know no different than MQTT in the sense that it is MQTT. Uh, it's a specification on uh, about how to use MQTT so that um, different devices and backend systems are kind of speaking the same language. In MQTT, uh, the payload structure, like the information you're sending with every message is very customizable. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just, you can use whatever kind of data that you want within that payload structure. And then also the topic structure is very customizable. You don't have to pre-create them. You don't have to do anything. Somebody coming in and connecting and there's obviously can be security um, limitations around this, but uh, device connecting can just create whatever topic uh, that it wants to um, within the broker dynamically. Um, and so uh, topics, by the way, are the, the way that messages are identified and routed. And, and this is the, the way that uh, devices, uh, MQTT clients will sort of say what information they're interested in, and then that payload data will be delivered to them. Sparkplug is all about putting a definition, a standardized definition on the topic structure, as well as the payload structure. And it does this um, <clears throat> in a way such that it enables edge uh, devices um, within the industrial IoT world um, to sort of expose all of the information about what metrics those devices have, and what formats those uh, metrics are in, um, and the values of those metrics themselves um, in a way such that the whole system can be edge driven. I mean, you can just, meaning you can just add devices into the system and then suddenly the backend uh, systems will just add those devices dynamically as well as kind of convert the 
the information from MQTT into their sort of internal data representations uh, automatically. And uh, so that's a big benefit to it. Um, but then also it's kind of making the data, uh, the, the data lighter weight uh, because it's, it has this ability to sort of combine all the metrics for particular devices without, with, without sort of taking all of the current values all of the time. You can sort of uh, take a, a subset of them that have changed since the last time um, a message was sent. And this is typical in this pattern where you have Gateway uh, gateways within the OT world that are connected to um, using the OT protocols to the devices themselves and sort of using that polling technology that those devices support, but then sending out the events in a way such that that um, data is lighter weight. And so that standardization just enables uh, participate uh, participation within the ecosystem quite easily from all of these different tools. But really in Sparkplug, it's very important to know that Sparkplug is a domain specific namespace that contributes to a unified namespace. And so um, use it in a way such that you're going to be able to easily get information from the OT world into the IT world, and then think about how you're going to uh, share that information and make it kind of more uh, widely uh, available, if that makes sense. Excellent, Ryan. Thank you. Now, what's interesting for me here is, um, and I'm going to I'm gonna use the survey results here as a proxy of the people also we have on the call here and who will be listening in. So we can see the need to, uh, well, I shouldn't say need, but evidence here is to uh, uh, pointing to the fact that not enough people have heard about Sparkplug. So that's, that's an opportunity for us to just make sure people have uh, access to our uh, Sparkplug Essentials Guide. So if you go on YouTube or go on our website, you will see a whole series uh, that our CTO has done. Um, again, an excellent resource for you to get a better understanding of what this is worth. Um, and also, what's uh, as, as, as Ryan was pointing out here, right? the Sparkplug is not standing all alone and, and by itself. This is something which is, again, MQTT coming even closer to the world in which IIoT use cases live, right? How do you create uh, easy, um, predictable ways in which you can bring systems together. And Sparkplug is a solid step in that direction. And it's working in conjunction uh, with the MQTT. So this is, again, you know, this is just me summarizing it very briefly here. But feel free to, you know, use the MQTT Essentials series as a guide for you to get going on this journey. All right. So that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving here and talk about now Everybody's favorite topic, right? IT, OT, <laughs> integration. Where are we? Um, where are we drawing that line between IT and OT? We can see a you know a, a bunch of things here with a mix of you know things going into the IT domain. More on the some a lot here on the OT side also. Um, so I'm going to bring this to you again. How do you define that IT OT uh, uh, environment? I'm not going to say divide. <laughs> and then wh why does it become necessary to bring these two things together? Uh, go ahead, please. Yeah, um, I like to think of the difference between OT and IT in, um, in the following way. So OT systems, they're typically very fit for purpose. Um, and we're talking about the system on the whole here. So not just the software, but also the hardware and how they work together in a way that's sort of finely optimized uh, for a specific purpose. And this aspect of them sort of makes them to be more isolated, uh, meaning they don't depend on other systems for their operation. And then um, really sort of <clears throat> autonomous as well, um, in, you know, in that, same, in, in that same regard. IT systems by sort of comparison really are designed to be generalized, meaning they work on uh, general hardware and software uh, platforms. They are um, all about sort of information processing, regardless of what that information is in a lot of cases. Um, and then, uh, but that, you know, that gives them sort of a broad set of uh, capabilities of being able to sort of leverage data from uh, different systems and work in a connected manner, meaning they sort of lack autonomy. They're connected to all these other systems and they're designed to work uh, in that way. And so really the, the, the two systems sort of work really well uh, together um, in that um, 
you know, you, you know, that connection between the two can sort of respect the different uh, requirements of each uh, kind of system, but then bring the benefits uh, across that connection. And really what we're talking about there is what industry 4.0 is all about. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Ravi, if you want to jump in there and sort of give the, the high level on, on what's the benefit of industry 4.0, because that's really what we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah, for sure, right? I mean, like when we talk about industry 4.0, right? I mean, it's it's good to kind of like uh, get grounded on the on the definition of industry 4.0, which is the fourth revolution of uh, industry, right? Uh, the whole industrial revolution, which is all about the power of data, right? And using that in combination with some of the other technologies that have developed over the years, like uh, the cloud, for example, right? Uh, the uh, the unlimited compute power that's there, uh, AI. ML, which is uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning technologies, smart sensors technologies, right? Co all coming together to be able to drive some of your smart manufacturing and industrial outcomes, right? And then uh, why, why is it gaining a lot of popularity? Because like people are seeing the outcome, like uh, according to one of the uh, McKinsey reports recently, right? Uh, people that have implemented Industry 4.0 Within one year, they are seeing like a 30 to 50 percent reduction in machine downtime, 10 to 30 percent increase in throughput, 15 to 30 percent increase in labor productivity, 8 85 percent more accurate uh, forecasting. So the numbers are there. That's why I think it is uh, really seeing traction and popularity. Not that it wasn't popular before, but now the technology is also there to be able to follow through on that. So that uh, would be my quick response on this. Uh, Gaurav, uh, no. yeah. Yes. Can we can we actually like uh, talk about Hive MQ? Maybe we'll have. Um... Yeah, let's do this because I think we would we would love to leave about fifteen minutes for for Q and A. And in that yeah. case, let me just skip ahead to uh, to some of the some of the you know um, sort of solution areas here, right? right. Um, do you want me to stay on this one here? Yeah. Yeah. So we'll let um, Ryan uh, talk about um, our. Yeah. Our enterprise MQ because we talked a lot about MQTT in general, but Ryan, if you yes. can touch upon what HiveMQ does, that'll be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Well, HiveMQ is an MQTT broker, and in MQTT, um, it's all about the connection uh, of uh, publishers to subscribers, and so there needs to be something in the middle um, routing those messages, understanding what uh, the interests of the subscriber, connecting them with the data of the publisher. And that's really uh, fundamentally what HiveMQ is. It's an MQTT uh, broker. And, um, you know, along with that, um, you know, well, first, first I'll talk about, um, you know, why that's relevant within industrial IoT and what's the major relevance of it. And, you know, these, these days, um, a, a big factor here in, in the world of industrial IoT is what's called the, the unified namespace. It's becoming a uh, sort of de facto standard for how these different systems uh, will share information between each other, how it will connect IT and OT, um, and how it will uh, connect those IT systems um, and even connecting those systems to things like supply chain and, and business backends, uh, ERP systems. And so um, it's becoming that standard because it's it's very good at lightly communicating uh, between all of these um, systems, keeping a light footprint, like we mentioned before. But when you are implementing that system, you're really putting it in place as a way to sort of innovate on top of it. You want all that data to be available in real time, and you want to be able to just tap into it and do so in a way that's sort of independent of other uh, parts of the organization that are providing data into it, because then you can innovate really quickly. So you really need to sort of have a system that does well at uh, sort of uh, separating the publishers and subscribers. And to do so, what you need to do is be able to rely on the accuracy and the quality of that data that's within that unified namespace. And this is really where HiveMQ shines because of the way that the architecture works uh, to provide reliability um, in an enterprise fashion, meaning you know high availability, not not um, you know still being able to deliver messages in in single point of failures. You know you don't want to be 
have your business processes sort of at the mercy of your, uh, your, your hardware infrastructure sort of working all of the time. Um, that's a big aspect there, you know, providing greater uh, service guarantees um, in terms of, uh, you know, outages like network outages. So not only your hardware infrastructure, but your networking infrastructure, if that goes down, you want to be able to sort of cache um, that, you know, that data at different levels and make sure that it's transmitted properly and reliably when those connections go back up. So these sort of fundamental architectural things about HiveMQ that really sort of sets it apart as an MQTP broker is what enables, uh, you know, industrial um, IoT projects to, to sort of uh, be viable and um, for, for those uh, companies using that approach to innovate. Awesome. But, you know, yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just I, going I, to I was like just... just... Go ahead, yes, go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Now, I just wanted to provide a quick quote that our, our customer that I, I actually like to talk to today, right? Basically, verbatim what they pro, what they talk to, to talk to us about. HiveMQ provides the critical infrastructure for their networks to ensure that they are highly reliable and scalable, which is absolutely important for them having that high level of uh, servers and the service levels. And now they don't have to deal with like one hour downtimes that they had to encounter in the past every week thanks to HiveMQ's enterprise capabilities. That's the it's quote up. from them today. <laughs> Thank, thanks for sharing that, Ravi. And my apologies on the slides moving around. My, my keyboard seems to have uh, acquired a mind of its own. Uh, but Ryan, do you mind just, uh, I know next we want to jump into questions, but just on the aspect of data quality, right? There's yep. so much going around in, in a factory environment specifically or in an industrial environment, to be more accurate. Um, there's, you know, discrepancies in schemas, you want to make sure the data is higher quality. So it, when it's being shared with other systems, people can rely on it. Essentially, you know, you're know, you trying to build a source of truth, which is effective, reliable, and so on. Do you mind just speaking to the need of that and how, how HiveMQ is solving for that? And then we'll jump into questions uh, people have submitted via chat. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, clearly, like I was talking about before, in this way that you're decoupling producers from consumers, you need to be able to trust that data. And a big part of trusting it is knowing that it's going to be in the format that you expect um, and uh, that it's going to be bringing in the data that you would expect to see and that you're not having anomalies and needing to deal with uh, a lot of inaccuracy because that just increases how much you need these different teams uh, that are innovating on this data to sort of work together. And the more you need them to sort of physically work together to talk and agree on how things are going to work, the more that sort of gums up the works of being able to sort of independently innovate in all different areas of your company and really leverage the data. And so that's that's what uh, um, uh, Gaurav has put up on the screen here, are, uh, the, the aspect of the platform that addresses this is called uh, Data Hub. And it's all about being able to um, you know, check the consistency of the format of the data, the ranges of the data, uh, the data values, and then also be able to sort of um, understand when those sort of uh, constraints have been violated and, and be able to address those things, like monitor the system and have notifications of when uh, data is sort of out of range. Yeah, right. Yeah, just a couple Thank of uh, pointers from me, right? Uh, and this is, again, feedback that I, I heard today, right? Two of the things, big reasons why you need data have. One is the cost of like your uh, bad data flowing through to the cloud, right? Because there is a huge cloud ingress cost, right? You don't want like to add to it by just having bad data. You would rather have, if you have to pay high cost and you need all the data, that's great. But why do you want to add all the bad data to that ingress cost? That's one thing, right? And the second thing is like the cost of you actually going into the cloud and uh, do, doing massaging of the data there is much, much higher, right? Compared to doing it at the source on the edge, right? Or the, or the enterprise. So these are the two significant data points due to which our customers are really uh, excited about this because now they can control their cost and they, they can save a lot of heartaches for them by doing this. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Okay, so so with that, I think we'll we'll switch to some of the questions which are in chat here. I think we uh, we we see questions in two categories here. One was people you know looking to learn more about the different technologies, and as Erin, my colleague here, has shared in chat, there are these good you know, good 
resources for you to um uh, to go and, and and check out so please please do that um i'm going to i'm going to start with this question from uh, from michael r miller and the question that michael has is around adoption of mqtt5 specifically right and and they're saying you know why why stay with um what's so so looking that looking at mqtt5 from the spark plug lens right why are things wh wh why do we need both in in that so i'm just broadening the question so we can cover it uh, more effectively um let me come to you with this ryan if you have any thoughts yeah yeah, well, um, Ivan Q very familiar with uh, with M uh, with MQTT five. Um, we've been working on the w one feature of of this called the shared subscription um, for quite a while now, even before it was part of the standard. That that um, feature of MQTT five is all about being able to um, have a group of 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 subscribers that will sort of the broker will sort of round robin or 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 load balance the messages that those uh, uh clients are interested in and one interesting thing is that um when you talk about bridging mqtt brokers um the the standard is used within the ability to sort of bridge those things so so when you think about having an application environment um on at the edge and you need to be able to work with applications and the data at the edge to, to reduce latency but you also need that data in the cloud and you need that data there reliably in the cloud what you want to do is sort of bridge to uh broker clusters uh together to have to do that transfer and sort of under the hood uh that's being leveraged is this uh shared subscriptions feature to make sure that the exchange of data between these two brokers is um, very performant, um, but also you know you can do that with uh, clients sort of consuming uh, the messages from applications as well, and this just helps your system uh, to scale. So that's just one factor that uh, comes to mind. Uh, yeah. Gaurav. Yeah. Awesome. So I'll stick with the same. Go ahead. Abhi. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to like uh, address uh, Durga Prasad Kohli's question, and uh, I think we have also a slide that we can um, kind of represent. So I thought it might be good. If you don't mind pulling up slide thirteen for me, Gaurav. The question, the question that was asked is, hey, in a, in a vertical stack that has like a PLC, a SCADA, an MES, an ERP, and a cloud, where exactly do you recommend MQTT Spark plug to be, right? And for example, he's looking at a machine condition monitoring application that takes analog data from the sensors, and he wants to send that to the cloud. I can give a quick answer, and then Ryan, if you want to chime in, right? So this is kind of like the, the way it is organized. Because MQTT is a public subscribe model, it's kind of like that centralized um, entity. The broker is a centralized entity where you have all of your uh, machine data from your OT systems flowing in, if you will. So all of your, your PLC data or SCADA data or like uh, sensor data that can come in through multiple sources, either our own edge product or like if they have a client or other methods can all come to the broker. And then from the broker, that can then be shared with some of the IT applications, uh, like an ERP application or an MES application or SCADA and others, right? The goal is that like all of these applications can now start seeing data in the context of what we call the unified namespace, all of the data in one location, so they can make be better decisions based on that. Suddenly your, your um, ERP data can now share information with the MES, and so new use cases that weren't available before can be unearthed. So just wanted to uh, add that perspective on that. So in this case, obviously okay. a condition monitoring application on the cloud can get the sensor data flowing through, and we can ensure that the data is um, the, the most up-to-date because of the way we do event-based processing. Right, right. Thank you, Ravi. So I'm going to stick in the same realm of, you know, uh, uh, MQTT. And then let's try to address a couple of questions we see around comparisons with OPC UA. And then also people are looking at comparison of Sparkplug with OPC UA. That, those are the kind of questions I see. So I think um, setting some context around that will be will be useful for the audience here. Um, I can start with uh, Ryan on this. Yes, please. Yeah, sure. Um... In terms of OPC UA, um, OPC UA is typically based off of uh, a, a poll response, but there's also um, 
there's also the ability to use OPC UA in an event-based manner over MQTT. Um, so if the comparison here is between sort of spark plug and using OPC UA, you can't say that uh, MQTT really uh, is part of that comparison. But what you do want to compare is sort of the um, openness of the data, like how many applications uh, can sort of consume that data in a way uh, that's that's going to be easy to leverage, that it's going to be in a format that's uh, that's generic, that um, can take uh, information from several from machines, several different machines, several different vendor provided solutions, and sort of bring that into um, a, a, a standardized single format that can be leveraged by backend systems in a consistent manner. And that's um, to some degree um, the thing that you want to be comparing the most when you're thinking about uh, Spark Plug and OPC UA. Right. And then also uh, in terms of the sort of coexistence, Ryan, that's possible. That's uh, that's that's a normal. Yeah, it, absolutely. So when we spoke before about um, these uh, gateways, which are really typically the area where you're going to see like a translation between data from the OT world and the IT world. What we see a lot is uh, OPC UA being sort of used um, more so on that OT uh, side of things to communicate between uh, machines and systems. And then having um, sort of a way to convert that data into uh, MQTT uh, is essential for that reliability and uh, that transfer of data to other systems in a reliable sort of lightweight manner. Um, and when, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Gaurav. Uh, you know, this is a great time to talk about how uh, our HiveMQ Edge platform can do conversions between uh, that uh, OPC UA protocol and MQTT uh, at the edge. And really, you know, a big advantage to using this is that it's compatible essentially directly with the unified namespace. So when we talk about Sparkplug, it's important to think about uh, that being sort of a domain specific namespace, really, really good at transferring data from sort of devices to uh, what's called IoT platforms like uh, SCADA systems like Ignition, for example. Um, and doing so reliably and light and in a lightweight manner. Uh, but when you think about the unified namespace and maybe even having an edge driven unified namespace, so not needing any kind of conversion between that domain specific namespace. And when I say namespace, I'm talking a lot about the topic structure uh, here. Um, but you know, having that data go directly into unified namespace, much sort of simpler, much easier. And edge is a lot about being able to sort of leverage that reliable, uh, enterprise broker of the unified namespace and just go directly to it uh, instead of through sort of a proxy IoT platform. Yeah. yeah. Hey, I know that and we only have a few minutes. Uh, real quick, um, this question I thought like Ryan, it might be good for you to address, right? Be because this, it talks about like um, the deployment of a data pipeline where there is MQTT and Apache Kafka involved. In a lot mm -hmm. of ways, Kafka is promoted as a broker that can be work with IoT, but then there is there is there are a lot of like um, uh, thoughts around that. If you can just like just talk about that, where an where an MQTT broker versus where a Kaf Kafka broker would be valid, or how do the two work together? Yeah, absolutely. The best way um, I think uh, I think it, there is to think about these two protocols and systems is to think that what MQTT and MQTT brokers do is it they bring complexity away from the clients that are connected to them, meaning they do really good routing of that information. They uh, provide really lightweight ways to uh, get the information that you're interested in receiving. Um, and so it's it's really bringing that complexity away. Also managing the connections of all of those devices and managing the session state, it's all complexity that's taken away from the clients. Whereas in Kafka and streaming platforms, you're really sort of that that platform is pushing the complexity out at for the benefit of throughput, just having massive amounts of data sort of running through that system, massive amounts of data being sort of uh, processed on the fly, which is called uh, stream processing. 
And then also integrating that data, creating big, big data data pipes to backend systems like big, uh, big data systems and databases. Um, and so the two, as you can imagine, since they're doing opposite things, are really, really working well uh, together. And then when you integrate those things, um, you get the power of both worlds. And this is why um, when you use HiveMQ, you have access to our Kafka extension uh, and our extension, which uses our extension SDK, which is really built into that whole architecture I was talking about earlier and allows you to sort of easily bolt on those uh, extensions and interact with streaming systems that have sort of a different purpose um, than uh, M MQTT. Great, great answer. I think we are up against time. Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> Erin, do you want to close? Yes, thank you all so much for your participation and um, all of these great conversations today. If we didn't get to your question, we will do our best to get back to you. Um, and then you all will receive a recording of this webinar. Thanks again for attending and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye very much. Thanks. Bye bye.